surrounded by his goodness Sing it louder if you found grace As you walk into a new day In the valley or in the victory No, he's never gonna leave me Sing it louder through the failure Are you glad we got a savior? Nothing's gonna stop us singing your praise Nothing in the world will stand in the way
me this morning say, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. With all of my heart, with all of my strength, with all that I have, I will sing let everything that has breath.
celebrate your name, Jesus.
smile in your presence it's not about being serious either but it's finding that balance of being joy in everything that we do in everything that we do
break it down and say I live I live my hands up lay my whole life down my whole life down before you I live my hands up lay my whole life down my whole life now is for you I felt like that song we sang just before this was something we needed to receive inside and then declare this, that regardless of what your circumstance looks like, regardless of where you've come from, regardless of what's happening, regardless of the no's that you face, that he is always a yes and he is working it out and you are enough. He loves you and you are enough. You are his child. There's not one that he loves more than the other. He runs to us all. He runs to us all. When we say, God, here I am and I am so desperate. He doesn't wait for us to reach him. He runs to us and he embraces us in the mess. In the ugliness of what we've done in our lives, he runs to us and he says, I'm here and I'm your father and I'm your creator. And there's not been one moment of one day that I have not thought of you personally. He loves you. He loves you. Whatever it looks like right now, he loves you and he wants you. You are wanted by the creator of the universe. You are wanted. You are loved. You cannot be any more loved today than you were yesterday. He loves you. He loves you with a passionate, pure love like you will never feel anywhere else. And for that, Jesus, we say, we lay down our lives and we receive we receive your love. We're not going to fight it anymore. We're not going to run from it. We're not going to doubt. We're not going to be so hard on ourselves that we think we can't reach you. We receive it today in Jesus' name, the work of the cross, because the cross was enough. The cross was enough. His blood was shed for you, and it's enough. It's finished. He wants you. In Jesus' name, we receive and we take hold of that truth right now in the name of Jesus, the name that is above all names. The enemy cannot speak to his children any longer about their worth because he has completed every bit of cost that needed to be paid. He has completed that in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. We give you our lives. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for this time of worship, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. All right. You may be seated. Thank you, worship team. Welcome to Two Rivers. We are so happy to have you here today. We love to see all of your beautiful faces. If you are a first-time visitor, this is your very first time ever to Two Rivers, or you've been here before but have never raised your hand to let us know you're here, would you do so right now, please? We'd love to see that you're here visiting. All right. Welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Wonderful. It's good to see so many new friends. We can't 
wait to get to know you. At the end of this service, if you go right out these doors here, there's a little gift for you in the Welcome Center. It includes a book of some faith-building stories from people right here in our church, as well as a, a card for a free meal. And who doesn't want a free meal in our cafe, right? Amen. So the purpose of that free meal is so that we can get out there and chat with you and you can get to know us and we can get to know you a little bit better. So don't miss out on that. We're going to take a quick two minute break. Please walk around and uh, greet somebody that you did not drive here with and we will be right back for some announcements. Thank you. <laughs> if you wouldn't mind getting back to your seat, that would be great. Thank you all. Holy Spirit is already moving in this place. If I can just let you guys know, there is some serious breakthrough happening. Yeah, we are excited about what he's going to do. Yes, we want it all. We want it all. And I want to let you know, Pastor Tom, our guest speaker, is bringing a word that I know will encourage you and and bring what he wants to do here. So if you can get back to your seat, we would greatly appreciate that. I am going to um, welcome our Pastor Tom up, and he is going to, oh no, we're going to do announcements. <laughs> All right, if you wouldn't mind turning your, <laughs> your attention to the screens for a few announcements, thank you. It's Pastor Appreciation Weekend. To all our pastors, we thank you for being such a great example of living a life of faith. For all the ways you make a difference in our community, thank you. Two Rivers is a place where friends become family. If you're new and you want to connect with others here at 2RC, you are invited to our upcoming meet and greet in the harbor. We can't wait to see you there. If you are interested in being baptized, our prerequisite class with Pastor Beverly will explain the significance of water baptism and answer any questions you may have. Sign up on our events page. On October 16th at 6 p.m., Pastor Paul Rapley will be joining us for a night of healing and miracles. Come out to get activated in the gift of healing for a fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit. Child care is available if you register by October 10th on our events page. Join Pastor Beverly for a one-day intensive on the topic of prayer on October 22nd from 9 to 3.30 p.m. 
Lunch is not provided and there's no cost for this course. Sign up on the website and contact Pastor Jessica with any questions. Amen. Do you believe prayer changes things? All right. A couple of things. I want to encourage you to pray for the Russia-Ukraine conflict as, as the acceleration starts. Russia is going to get more desperate. That could involve the whole world. So we're going to pray for that right now, but we're going to specifically pray for Hengame and her family are from Iran. Iran is going through an incredible crisis right now. There's scores of people being killed right now. Most of them are teenagers. They've had it. And so there's this huge rebellion, and that country's through a crossroads right now. So let's pray for these things and pray for the offering as well. Father, we lift up the Russia-Ukrainian conflict. We realize that we don't wage war against flesh and blood. There are principalities and powers and heavenly places seeking to control, dominate, and destroy the world. And so we bind those militant spirits, and we pray that you would give Russian leadership the courage to do the right thing. We pray that this killing and death would stop in Jesus' name. Father, we lift up the nation of Iran. We lift up the young people. We lift up the people that are sick of the way that they have been oppressed. And it seems like it's got to the point where they're not going to take no for an answer. We don't want to see any more young people dead. We want these rulers to be removed in Jesus' name. We don't know how you can do it, but we pray that they would be swept out and that Iran would become a free country and that the gospel of Jesus Christ would run through that population, bringing them to Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Father, we're so grateful for your word, your word tells us in the end days, things will be like this, and we trust you. We don't walk in fear, we walk in faith. We were born for such a time as this. Bless our offering for your glory as well, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. It's good to see you here this morning. We've been having a great weekend. We just finished up with the teens set apart. We believe... And you need to listen to this. A retreat is worth about a year of spiritual growth. When you say as a man, no to retreat, you said no to growth. When you said as a woman, no to retreat, you said no to growth. And when you say no as a teen, you, there's things that happen at retreats that don't happen any other place. They don't happen any other place. That's why we're a retreat church. But we can't drag you there. In fact, is we wouldn't want to drag you there because if you go willingly, filled with faith, God meets you. But we, we, we finished last night. Glad to see the girls here. They, they stayed up till 3 o'clock Friday night. And then this morning, just the boys were here. You realized who had slept the night before. Some of you serving. Oh, yes, the green shirt serving. Yes, that's right, too. Okay. So you ready for a, yeah, you can't make blanket judgments, can you? <laughs> there are sinners in the house, I know this. <laughs> okay. We have Pastor Tom Flaherty with us. He's from Teresa and I's home church. The church has sent us here in the very first place a number of years ago, too many years ago. And uh, they stood behind us. Pastor Tom is an outside elder for us. And in times of crisis, we call on them to help us sort through our situation because sometimes you just need outside eyes. We are grateful for what they're doing. They're experiencing a move of God and a number of our other fellowship churches are experiencing a move of God right now, which means other denominations are also experiencing a move of God. So we, we're seeing something start in the United States we haven't seen for a while. And we, we want to be part of that. We want to press in. So Here's how we press in this morning. We welcome our speaker, we listen, and we respond in Jesus' name. Let's welcome Pastor Tom. It is such a delight to be here, and I had a great time with the teenagers. That was amazing, but... 
But to be with the, the Alexanders, they are lifelong friends. And, you know, you can make new friends, but you can't make old friends. And uh, so, Tom, thank you for having, having us here and trusting me with the pulpit. Um, would you mind standing in honor of God's word? Psalm 51, verse 12. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Let's pray. Lord, you said that the joy of the Lord is our strength. So a person without joy is weak. A church without joy is weak. But Lord, there's so many things that suck joy from us. There's so many things that are aligned by the enemy to steal joy from us. Would you come today? Help us get honest with where we are. And Lord, bring us back. Either align us for the first time or realign us to the place where there is joy where we see you as you are and we see ourselves as we are in you. Lord, do something in this place that only you can do. Hide me behind the cross. God, I acknowledge freely there's only one teacher and that's the Holy Spirit. Spirit of God, come. Fill this place, flood this place with revelation from heaven and we'll give you all the praise and the glory for every good thing that happens here. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. 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 You may be seated. So the title of the message is Restoring Joy. So this comes at a time in David's ministry where he's still the king, still doing life, still going to church, still doing the worship thing, still doing the family thing. But it's a, it's a crisis time in his life because the joy that he used to have, he realizes, is gone. He says in verse 6, you desire truth in the innermost part. And, and joy is something that comes from deep within. Happiness is your circumstances, and, and we go from happy to sad very easily. But joy is something much deeper. And for, for David to lose his joy is a big deal. That David is God's guy. He is the man after God's own heart. In the beginning, God sets Adam and Eve in this garden called Eden. Eden means delight. We were created to be God's delight and for us to find our delight in him. Yet after the, the, the fall, after the curse, we almost completely lose the word delight from the Bible until David. David has this revelation of delight. Psalm 18, 19, God rescued me, he delivered me, he brought me out into a spacious place. Here's why, because he delighted in me. David had a revelation that God's delight is in us. Even in our weakness, even in our immaturity. And then he calls the people of God, Psalm 37, 4, delight yourself in the Lord. The, Make him the main event. Get delight in him. And he'll give you the desires of your heart. He'll give you everything else. Everything else will come together. But aim for this. Most in America are trying to get all of the desires of their heart and try to add a little God on. And it, it doesn't work. So David losing his joy. This is very, this is very serious. So he had to get honest. And if you, oftentimes we come to church and we just get caught up. Church is not a place where we come to judge each other. 
Church isn't a place where we come to impress each other. Church isn't a place where we come to compete with each other. Here's why we come to church. To get aligned with God. Or to get realigned with God. And to do that, you got to be brutally honest. You, you got to deal in truth. And so we, we welcome the truth. We're not afraid of the truth, even if it hurts us. Lord, come. We live in a, a, in a world of deception and of lies and of images and of marketing. We come to church. God, please, please break through and shed light into my darkness. Please, God, whatever it is that's binding me, whatever it is that I'm believing that is the wrong thing, expose it, even if it hurts me short term, so, so that I can, I can live the way you want me to live, so that, so that I can be free. So restoring joy. I've got three questions for you today. And only you can answer them with the Holy Spirit's help. Three questions that take us out of joy. First one is this. Have you become disconnected from the goodness of God. So I don't, I don't mean, do you think God isn't good? I'm, this isn't a theological question. God is good. We believe God is good in him is light and no darkness at all. God is good. But what about in your identity, in your heart? Are you connected to the goodness of God? Are you, are you tasting the goodness of God? Or has something happened that's disconnected you from God's goodness to you? I was asked to do our youth retreat. This is 2021. COVID really in our county in Wisconsin, most of Wisconsin was kind of like Arizona, a little freewheeling with COVID. Our county was absolutely on lockdown. And it was really, really hard on young people. And we go on this trip every year to Belize. We take a ton of youth, a ton, about 30 kids, and build stuff. And we do a camp down there. And we couldn't do it in 2020. And then it got canceled again in 2021. And, and so we're like, we can't do that. So let's at least do a camp. And I was going to speak three times because I usually speak three times when we're in Belize. And so I'm going to prepare these messages. And I've got uh, the first message is going to be on repentance. And I get this. I'm, I'm working on repentance. And I feel like the Lord is telling me they can't repent. Many of them can't repent because they become disconnected from my goodness. What? And I get a picture in my mind of a young girl named Annie Nelson. Annie, Annie was from my previous place, was in Montevideo, Minnesota, and she was in my group on, on Wednesday nights called Gap. We had something in the church for kindergarten through fourth grade on Wednesday nights, and we had a youth group that was seventh through twelfth, but there was nothing for the fourth through sixth graders. And I, I'm like, they need something. I'll, I'll be that. You know, it, the, the, they're just too old for the kids' stuff and too young for the youth group. And so I'm like, I'll, I'll do that group. I'll, I'll take that group. But there needs to be something for them. And, and so. This group kind of caught kids' attention because it was special and it was for them. And so kids all over the city came to Gap. People that, kids that didn't even go to our church came. And, and Annie was one of them. She was, uh, she came from a very rough background. And, uh, but she loved Gap. She was there every week. It was the highlight of her week. And so, uh, you can imagine trying to control 60 fourth or sixth graders. You can imagine this is, there's going to have to be some very strict boundaries for this to work. And so 
Um, everybody knew what the rules were that when I was talking, when I was teaching, that was not time for them to talk. And, and so if you were, you would get corrected and you would get a warning. If you did it again, you had to be removed from the group that night. And we had originally tried to just move them out the door, and then we found out they make noise outside the door, and there's still a distraction outside the door. So we came to, you got to send them across the street to Casey's gas station. It's a convenience store, and, and so that's where you got sent. And it was kind of the outer courts. Um, and so, uh, so, but on this particular night, Annie was being naughty. I'm talking, and she's being naughty, and she's talking, and I said, Annie, Annie, you need to be quiet. I'm talking now. we got to respect. And I start, and she starts going again. And I'm like, she's my favorite, keep in mind. So I'm like, okay, Annie, honey, please, you, you cannot be talking while I'm talking. Start going again. Sure enough, she starts up again. And I am like this close to sending her to Casey's. I mean, I am this close. I am just about to send her across the street and the Holy Spirit says, stop. And instead of sending her across the street, I just say this to her. I just look her in the eyes. I said, Annie, what's wrong? And like only a sixth grader could do, she goes from kind of being that smart aleck to just weeping, just boom. She's just a puddle of tears. We can't stop her. She's convulsing. The kids all gather around her. Everybody's got a hand on her. And we finally get out of her that her favorite uncle died the night before in a car accident. And I couldn't see it. But God did. God saw what I couldn't see. The, the time that she most needed God and most needed the church, she almost got kicked out. But God saw her. And what God was saying to me about these teenagers about being disconnected from the goodness of God is they've been suffering through COVID. And, and, and the difficulty is, is <laughs> parents and teachers and even pastors, when we're in pain, we've got our own fears. There's a pandemic going on. All we do with the kid, we don't think about their pain. We don't think about what they're going through. It's just obey, get your mask back on, get it back on. Da, 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 and they're just being told what to do. But they were, they were suffering as well. And so God, God wanted me to tell, to, to reconnect them to the goodness of God before I preach the message. So I start the retreat out. There are 82 kids there. I start by telling the story about Annie. And I said, guys, I want you to know something. I know, these, I, I know these last months have been really hard. But I want you to know something. God has seen you. When your parents haven't seen you and when even pastors haven't seen you, God has seen you. And he wants you to know that he's still good even though life is hard. But he's not just good. He's good to you. He wants you to taste and be connected to his goodness. And so I said to them, I said, before we even get into the message tonight, if you have been traumatized by this last season and you've been disconnected in your heart from God's goodness, stand to your feet. And 40 of the 82 stand to their feet. And we just prayed a little prayer. And God can reconnect us to his goodness. Did you know that the Bible says in Romans 2.4 that it's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance? Do you want to know that why that is? Of course, I've had a lot of time to think about it because of 
this experience. Because if we're not connected to his goodness, when bad things happen, which they're happening all the time in the world, we tend to blame God. We, we tend to treat God as the enemy and get angry at God and blame God. And it's only when we're connected by his goodness that we can see things right, that the, pro the problem's not with God, the problem's with, always with us. We had a men's retreat a couple weeks ago and uh, our speaker, he said, I, I love speaking to men. I was going to speak on the lion heart of men and going forward and warfare and, and man up and, you know, just, just, just really rally the troops. He said, and God, God told me to speak on grief. I'm like, really? And so he did this retreat on grief and it, he, he talked about that, that grief is loss. Grief comes when we lose something, and it's not just losing a person. It can be losing a, a, a job or losing health or losing, losing fr a friend, losing a home that you had, losing your cat, losing your animal. And, but he made a distinction between grief and bereavement. Bereave, the definition of bereavement is unexpected loss. Something is torn from you. Something is stolen from you. You are robbed of something. And it leads to, to trauma. And of course, through the pandemic, there, there's been so much loss and so much bereavement in, in every way. And he, and he talked about Jesus being acquainted with grief and that he came to bear our griefs and, and how to deal with our stuff and our trauma and, 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 and let God bring his healing to our trauma. It says that Jesus is anointed to bind up the brokenhearted. And so a couple of weeks ago, we had a River Rising meeting. We have, we've started these meetings once a month on Sunday nights called River Rising to acknowledge that God is already doing things. It's not like the river is going to come at some future time. No, there, it's happening now. Tom, Tom acknowledged it. There, there, it. God's doing something right now that needs to be celebrated. But it's not fullness yet, folks. <laughs> The fullness of what God wants to do. We dare not stop and say, well, this is it. We, this is as far as it goes. This is amazing. Nope, there's way, way more that God wants to do. As the river rises, it's less human control and more divine control. It, it's less about what we're doing. It's more about what God's doing. When, when, you're in the, when, you're, when it's over your head, you don't even have to make a plan. You just, you just stay off the rocks. The river will take you wherever you need to go. But our speaker, our men's speaker was still there. So we got into talking about trauma. And, and I, got, I got a picture of Jesus in a surgeon's gown. And there was a Christian on the table, on the operating table. And Jesus, you couldn't even see Jesus' hands. They were buried inside his heart. But what struck me was the joy that Jesus had, that he got to operate. That he got to operate. Did you know that Jesus is the only one that can bind up the brokenhearted? Do you know all the world can do is give you a pill or, or help you understand why you are so traumatized? But G Jesus is the only one that can put it back together. He, he's the only one that can bring healing so that, so that we can go forward. Trauma oftentimes is a disconnection with the goodness of God. And even though we're still living, even though we're still serving, even though we're still doing life, we can live disconnected and because of that, disconnected from joy. Have you been disconnected from the goodness of God? That's the first question. Here's the second one. Are you living out of the wrong wineskin. 
In Matthew chapter 9, um, John the Baptist's disciples are saying, why aren't you guys fasting the way we're fasting? And Jesus says, here's why they're not fasting. The bridegroom is here. He said, but the day is coming where they will fast, but it will be different. It be for a different reason than why you guys are fasting. He said, for you can't put new wine into an old wineskin or that wineskin will burst. You have to put new wine into a new wineskin. And with Jesus, the wineskin was changing. The old wineskin was performance. It was us being good enough to get God's blessing. And the new wineskin, that J Jesus changed it, is grace. We're God, we start out favored by God. We start out loved by God. And we receive his grace up front. So we live from favor and from love. Not trying to get favored and trying to get love. But we, we, we live from this. It's a, it's a, it's a completely different wineskin. And so my question for you is, are you living out of the wrong wineskin? Once again... I'm not questioning your theology. If you're a Christian here today, you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are saved by the grace of God. You are not saved because you're good. You're not saved because you're religious or because you've helped enough little old ladies across the street. You know you can't save yourself. This is where, where the gospel starts. Jesus died in my place. He, he paid the price for me, and I am saved purely by his grace as I put my trust in the, in the finished work of Christ. And I'm not questioning your theology. I'm saying, what do you live out of? In, in your actual life, what are you living out of? Because the easiest thing to do, especially for Americans, is to slip back into performance. The whole world's living out of the performance wineskin. And it's just easy when you're in it all the time to go back to it. Galatians chapter 3 Paul addresses this with the Galatians. He says, you foolish Galatians, who bewitched you? You started out in the spirit. Are you now going to per per perfect it by the flesh? Let me ask you a question, he says. He's asking a question, just like I'm asking a question. Does he who does miracles among you, does he do it because of the hearing of faith or because of the works of the law? Is he doing it because you're good enough or is he doing it because he's good? And then he says this, he asks this question. In uh, 4.15, and I, I'm going to give it to you out of the New Living Translation because it's so good. Here's what he says. Where is the joy and the grateful spirit that you once felt? You're, you're, you're still doing the stuff. You're still serving. You're still going here and there. But, but it, the fountain of joy that it came from is gone. A few verses after that, he says, you brothers and sisters, like Isaac, were born of a promise. Isaac means laughter. He's like, Where, where's the laughter? Where's the joy? I, I've learned something. We need to take God very, very seriously. This is the fear of the Lord. Everything God says is very serious. Eternity is serious. Salvation is serious. When he gives us command, it's serious. We need to take God very, very serious. But here's the other thing I've learned. We can't take ourselves too seriously. This isn't about how great we are, guys. It's about how great he is. This isn't about what amazing thing we're going to figure out. This is going to be about his goodness that overcomes our weakness. Where's your laugh? Have you lost your laugh? You might be in the wrong wineskin. So let me tell you a little of, of my story. 2012, I am pastoring this large church called City Church. And frankly, I'm, I'm kind of being crushed by it. I'm, I'm speaking here, there, everywhere, and I'm trying to do a good job, and lots of people are depending on me, and so I'm, I'm, I'm just working really hard, but I'm burning out, and my executive pastor recognizes it. He says, I'm going go to the, I'm gonna go to our elders and ask for a sabbatical. I said, Joel, don't do it. Don't do it. I, I'm, I'm kind of made out of the same mold as your pastor. 
except he's more so than me. I mean, he's dairy farmer. You do it. You just persevere. You don't interview yourself. You just get it done. And I'm kind of like that. You know, the world doesn't get a sabbatical. I don't need a sabbatical. I'm be, I'll be fine. It's the same reason men don't like going to the doctor, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, I'm in Michigan on vacation. And early in the morning, you know that little time between when you wake up and before you've had your coffee? You know that kind of that fog? You're, you're, you're up, but you're not all the way up. I'm in that time, and I have a sentence come into my mind, just as clear as can be, and you're going to have to judge this because it wasn't, it wasn't from the Bible. It was from the Fellowship of the Ring. <laughs> <laughs> here, here, here was the line. You are like too little butter spread over too much bread. You are like too little butter spread over too much bread. And there was, there was no way to deny it. This is exactly my, I had become very, very thin. I had no margin in my life. And I came back to Madison and I said to my executive pastor, ask the, ask the elders for a sabbatical. I, I need a sabbatical. I don't know what's going to happen on it, but I, I, this isn't working. I'll eventually burn out. So uh, it was a two-month sabbatical. We did several different things. The last thing we did was we went to Bethel in Redding, California. And there was, a, there was a healing conference led by Chris Gore, one of their, one of their pastors. And, um, and the first night, there's four, it's, it's just for pastors. It's a healing concert, it's just for pastors, 450 of us. And the first night, he uses this phrase, the ease of heaven. And, and, and it's like very central to everything they do. He's like, he's like, if you want to see miracles, you don't dial up, you dial down. You, you got to enter into the ease of heaven. You got to get into the flow of what God is doing. It's less about you and you, when you own that and let God be God. And, and so this whole idea of, of the ease of heaven and then they, the different pastors spoke during the week and, and all of these guys have obviously a much bigger church, but they all had huge ministries and had written books and way more pressure than I have. And I'm burning out. They're all happy. I'm like, what's, what's up with this? And they all said something similar. They said it in different ways, but here, here was the gist of what they said. If you host the presence of God, you don't have to be that good at your job because God's really good at his. And it brought so much life to me because all I want to do is be good at my job. And all of a sudden, I had permission to not be so amazing at my job. And I had something else to give myself to. Just welcome his presence and he'll help you do your stuff. Yeah, you still got jobs to do, but it's, it, it's no longer your responsibility. It's your response to his ability. It's a very different wineskin. So it turns out, have you ever had a living parable? Have you ever had something in your life that was illustrating what God was speaking to you and they, they just collide at the exact same time? Let me give you an example of a living parable because this is what happened. <laughs> so 2007, we moved from Montevideo to Madison and we, we, we couldn't sell our house. And it, it lasted for six years. For six years, we couldn't sell our house. And I had this realtor, this poor, poor realtor that I just... I had so many ideas. I'm like, you know, God's got his part. He'll sell it. But I need to do my part, which is to do everything else. And, and so I, 
I had all kinds of suggestions of how we were going to get rid of this house and what he could do and where he could market it. And then, of course, I've got all the spiritual things, too. I'm fasting and I'm praying and I'm confessing and I'm commanding. And I mean, I tried everything. You, you, you name it, I tried everything I could do to get rid of that house. <clears throat> and uh, so... We're about to go on sabbatical, and it's spring. Everybody knows spring is the time, especially in the Midwest. That's when you sell the house. So I'm about to call the realtor and give him the new game plan. We're going to do this. And, uh, and I'm about to call him, and the Holy Spirit says this. I'm going to sell the house while you're resting. And by this time, I'm not saying that's the Holy Spirit. I'm, I'm so wounded over this house. I'm like, yeah, I don't think so. I had thought God told me he was going to sell the house like three other times, and it, everything fell through. So I'm, I'm a little cynical right now. I'm going to sell the house while you're resting. And I'm not necessarily believing that that's God, but here's what I said to myself. Nothing else has worked. <laughs> it's not like I'm going to lose if I do nothing. I, I mean, nothing else has worked, so why not try doing nothing? <laughs> so I'm like, all right, I won't even call him. You sell it. And I, I just don't think about it. I, I, every morning, every evening, I had an unsold house. Every morning, I, I didn't think about it at all on sabbatical. I'm just like, it, it was just gone. We're on our way back from Bethel. And I get a call from our realtor. He said, Tom, the house is sold. He said, and I mean, it's really sold this time. <laughs> I didn't fully believe it until the, the, the check went through. But um, <laughs> let me tell you what the new wine skin is. Hebrews chapter 4. 9 through 11. It's very radical. For there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. And whoever enters this rest ceases from his own works as God did from his. And then the great oxymoron of scripture, be diligent to enter that rest. <laughs> Work, one, one translation even says it, work to enter that rest. <laughs> lest you fall by the same example of unbelief. Guys, the Sabbath day of the Old Testament was a picture of salvation. And, but it's not just to save us. We, don't, we do get saved by laying down all of our own efforts to save ourselves and trusting Jesus. But this is how we're to live. This is the wineskin. God wants to enter, us to enter into the works he has that he wants to do in us and through us. And so we got to stop doing our own stuff and enter into the spirit, enter into this rest. And from that place will flow all of the fruit, all of the, the things that God wants to. And as long as we're intent on performance and us doing it our way, you know what the Holy Spirit does? He just says, okay, let's see what you got. You're going to do it yourself. All right, let's see. Let's see. Let, impress me. You know, everything that we do in our own strength burns. Jesus said, abide in me. Make this your work, union with me. Be diligent to enter that rest. Watch over your relationship with me. Host my presence. Be careful to, to, be, to be aligned with me, and you will bear much fruit. It will just happen naturally. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Are you living in the wrong one skin? And then finally... Are you filled with a new wine? So it turns out Christianity is about something more than having right theology. It's more than the initial experience of being born again 
and knowing that your sins are forgiven and that you're going to go to heaven, that we, were, we are wineskins that are supposed to be filled with the new wine. So, so Acts 2, 17, God says this. In the last days, I am going to pour out my spirit on your sons and your daughters, and they are going to prophesy. In the last days, God says, something's going to change because right now, I can't pour out my spirit. I, I dribble out a little of my spirit. If I, if I do too much, I kill you. But I'm going to make a new covenant by, by which... I will not be hindered. I can pour out as much as I want. Gee, the, the new covenant through Christ, through Christ's blood, it doesn't just forgive us and save us so that we'll go to heaven when we die, which is extremely important, but it also opens up heaven so that we can be filled with new wine now. And I want to submit to you that this is the best version of you and me, us Filled, being yourself, filled with the Holy Spirit. I said this to the teenagers. God only anoints the original. Yeah. If you're trying to copy somebody else, trying to compete with somebody else, you're probably not going to have much. But be yourself. But the best version is you filled with the Holy Spirit. So here's Ephesians 5.18. Don't be drunk with wine. The NLT says, for it will ruin your life but be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then he gives like three things. Singing hymns, singing spiritual songs, lifting your heart and grateful. Give yourself an atmosphere that, that welcomes the presence of God. And, but, but this be filled with the Spirit, it, we, it doesn't quite translate easily into English because the, the way, the way it, it's in the Greek is be being filled with the Spirit. It's not a one-timer. It, it's be being filled. Be filled again and again and again. So it, the question, number three, is not were you filled with the Spirit? It's are you filled with the Spirit? Bless God, Pastor Tom, I was filled with the Holy Ghost 20 years ago at camp meeting. I remember it like it was yesterday. Awesome, amazing. Are you filled today? Are you filled today? Here's what I've noticed. We get drained every day. We get drained. Come to church on Sunday, you usually get filled up. Some of us, honestly, by Sunday afternoon, we're empty again. <laughs> It lasted like one hour. Like for me to stay filled, I'd have to be in church all the time. And it, it, so it, it, why? Because life happens. We have difficulties. Just taking care of responsibilities. We get drained by that. We get drained by people. We get drained by this and we get drained by that. And, and then you, you've got, and that's, that's if everything's going right and then something goes wrong and then that's a huge drain. And then, and, and, but life keeps happening. And then there's also ministry where you, you are purposely pouring out. You are, you are freely giving yourself and God has it so that we empty ourselves out on the altar of other people's faith and serving other people. And, and we take all this energy that we've got in the Lord and we, and we pour it all gladly for the sake of Jesus. But that leaves us empty. So we need to be filled again. So I call it the intimacy of dependence. So God has set it up to give us clues that we are dependent creatures. Have you ever noticed that you eat three meals a day? Isn't that weird? Even though you ate yesterday? You're, you got you to eat again? And, and people always have these water bottles. Why? Because you have to, you have to keep drinking water even though you drank before. Of course, the most vulnerable one is breathing, oxygen. Can you believe what wimps we are? We can't go an hour without breathing. <laughs> God's given us a clue. You, you, you need me. You, you, 
Spiritually, we need to be filled again and again. This is the best version of us. And what happens is, of course, if you, if you stop breathing for an hour, you die. The problem spiritually is if you stop being filled with the Spirit, you still walk around. You still consume food. You still do all this stuff. But let's, it's the walking dead. Spiritually, you're dead. And of course, most of the planet is walking around spiritually dead. They're just surviving. Unfortunately, many Christians are also walking around dead. And God has got this new wine he wants to fill us with. There's many ways that God can bless us without giving us himself. He can heal you. He can provide for you. He can give you direction. But to give you joy, he has to give you himself. Did you notice that it doesn't say joy is your strength? It's the joy of the Lord is your strength. David said, in your presence is fullness of joy. He can't give you joy without giving you himself. Jesus said, these things I have spoken to you, that, in, that my joy might be in you and that your joy might be full. The, the joy comes from this intimate union with him. So I'll end with this. Luke eleven thirteen. I was talking to the young people about this verse. If you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And I said, how many of you wash your hands and your face before you get in a shower? And three of them raised their hand. I'm like, okay, okay, you three are anomalies. You know, you just ruined the whole message. No, the, the, the point of getting in a shower is the shower is going to clean me. I don't clean up for a shower. You don't clean up for God. Your evil and your darkness doesn't keep God from you. God is the answer for your evil and your darkness. And he invites us to come just as we are and let him do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. So if we could have every head bowed and every eye closed, The first call is just simply this. Maybe you're here today and you realize, I'm not sure I'm a Christian. I, I'm not sure that Jesus lives in me. I'm not sure that if I died, I'd go to heaven. I'm not sure my sins are forgiven. I've kind of been trusting my own goodness and I kind of thought I was about my own goodness, but this is a different thing. Jesus says this, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, doesn't matter how much you've sinned, how long you've sinned, how addicted you've been, how, how, how you blaspheme God in the past. Jesus is knocking. And if you open the door, he says, I will come in. The Bible says, to as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the children of God. God knocks. He knocks through beauty. He knocks through trials. He knocks through sins. He knocks through trouble. He knocks. He's knocking and saying this, you need a Savior. You need a Savior. You need a Savior. You need a Savior. And if you're here today and he's knocking, I've got your head bowed and your eyes closed because this is very private. It's between you and God. But I'm going to have you raise your hands because somebody helped me open my door and I like to pray a prayer to help people open their door. So if that's you, Jesus is knocking. And today you want to open your door and say yes to him. Would you just raise your hand real high right now long enough for me to see it? I got you, bro. I got the two and back over there. God bless you. Anybody else by upraised hand? You want to open your door today. Jesus, come in and say, man, I got you, bro. God bless you. I got you over here in the back too. God bless you. So if you raised your hand, would you just slip it over your heart right now and just pray something like this in your own way. Lord, thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying for me on the cross. Thank you for chasing me down and continuing to knock. And Lord, today I open my door by faith. I right now, I say, Jesus, come into my heart. Come in, be my Savior, be my Lord, wash away my sins. I receive the gift of eternal life, the gift you paid for that I get for free. 
Now I want to pray for you. Lord, would you come and do for each of these what only you can do? Holy Spirit, would you give a witness that they're born again? Would you give a witness that this wasn't just something they said to the air or a man prayed, but, but God heard the prayer of their heart. Witness in their hearts, I pray, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. And then if we could all stand to our feet. And if you wouldn't mind just opening your, your arms, we just call this the receive position. Lord, you know everybody's address. You know wh wh how everybody's been living, what identity. You know who's been disconnected, who's been. Lord, you see it all. Would you make adjustments? Or take us out of that performance identity and get us back onto the fountain of your free grace. Would you restore laughter, God? Father, I pray that we wouldn't make being filled with the Spirit so difficult. Lord, you're, you shed your blood. There's an open heaven over you. Just ask to be filled. Fill us, Lord. Fill us, Lord. Fill us, Lord. And then help us to make a lifestyle around being filled. Help us, Lord, to be being filled with your Spirit. Teach us how to host your presence. Help us, Lord, to laugh more and to not struggle to try to do everything so perfectly, but allow the perfect one to live in and through us. So guys, here's how we're going to end today. I'm going to ask our ministry teams to come forward. And if you've got any need, you can come forward. Here's the group I want to pray for because I felt this morning, I just felt like this was the decree. If you are one of those that was bereaved and you have been living in trauma, you have been filled, but you've been filled, what you've been filled with is grief, anxiety, anger, sometimes back and forth between those three. And it, that's all a hint to you, something's wrong. Something, something needs to get healed inside. And so if, if that's you, come to my line. Anything else, we got all kinds of ministry teams. So God bless you. Please get your children and have a great day.